This has been uh, such an interesting season for us as a church. I'm gonna tell you, you're not gonna wanna miss this, this series. Get one of these guides. They're absolutely beautiful. Everything in it is done in-house, and I'm just so, so grateful. Pastor Eric led the charge. You might remember uh, back in February, I told you we were really gonna double down on spiritual formation and try and provide some really intentional opportunities for you to just uh, grow in your faith and and this is, I told you it'd take 12 to 18 months, so, so bear with us. We'll get there, and it took nine. That's how good the team is. Like, I'm so excited. So it's gonna be great. We shot video at a vineyard in California, and it's just, it's gonna be epic. You're not gonna wanna miss this. Make sure that you get one. We've already had, I think, 500 people have already, over 500 people have already uh, pre-registered to be part of it, so it's gonna be great. Uh, three weeks ago, I also mentioned that uh, we were running, I uh, did a series on irrational generosity and that we were running about 15% behind on our projected giving budget, which was not necessarily uncommon that time of year coming out of the third quarter. But I just wanna thank you. We've had three really solid weeks and I believe as that continues with your generosity and just faithfulness, we're gonna finish the year exactly where we need to be. So thank you for helping us with that. Irrational means not logical or reasonable. And listen, we all know we serve in an uh, irrationally generous God because of all of the things that he's done for us. As you study the word of God and you learn the things that he's done for us, you learn about his irrational love for you and me, all of these things, it, it can be overwhelming when we begin to see all these things. We ask, why? Why would you care for us the way you do? Why would you provide for us the way you do? As we continue to grow in our understanding of God, it moves us to respond to respond by leaning into all of these irrational things that he's provided for us. Today, I wanna talk about another one of those things. To get us started, the Maui, Maui County newspaper has a fun little weekly rhythm of inviting their readership to submit a picture, and if your picture is chosen, it goes in the Thursday uh, printed edition, and it will run all week long in the online version of their paper. This picture that's up behind me now is one that won and was displayed. It's a sea turtle in Maui enjoying the sand at the end of a long day. Makes you want to be a turtle, doesn't it? Yeah. It was titled, Finding Peace in Paradise. I show you this because for many people, peace is something experienced under the right circumstances and in the right place. And we tend to believe that peace will be found externally rather than internally. Another way to describe this would be that you might have a place that you would call your happy place. Do you have a happy place? I, have a, I love the beach. I really love the beach. My wife, Beth, she loves the mountains, especially if there's big snowflakes coming down in the fire and the fireplace is crackling. Um, we all have different places that we, as a matter of fact, I wonder what yours is. Where do you tend to find peace in the middle of life's chaos and complexity. Would you do me a favor? Just tell the person right next to you real quick. Give you just a couple of seconds. Tell them where your happy place is. Go ahead and do that real quick. <clears throat> Probably didn't give you enough time to fully unpack that, so you might wanna go get a cup of coffee later. And uh, figure that out. You plan your place or your trip to your happy place. But here's, here's the problem with the happy place, right? It's elusive, isn't it? Because the second you leave, your happy place, the peace can seem to leave as well, right? And if you're like me, the feelings of worry and anxiousness uh, can fill our hearts and our minds so easily. We all have some margin from time to time of worry and Anxiety. As a matter of fact, if you've even this week, whether it's low grade or rather intense, if you've had some feelings of worry or anxiety this week, will you just raise your hand? Just look around. Yeah. For those that don't have their hand, they have anxiety about raising their hand, right? Like that's what that's all about, right? Listen, we all have some margin of this, the un uncertainties of the future, the pressures of daily life, the challenges that we face can easily overwhelm us. Even as Christ followers, we can find ourselves in these spots where we struggle to fully trust that what has been told to us is true, that everything will work out for the best. We can even reach a point where we question God's presence and his care in our lives. 
So when we're faced with suffering and injustice and unanswered prayers, and there can even sometimes feel like there's this deafening silence that leaves us all alone, we end up just fantasizing about going to our happy place, right? We want a way to kind of escape to get there. Well, it's interesting to me that researchers at Penn State University did a study recently on worry. And what they did is they invited a bunch of people to be part of this study. And if you said yes to be in the study, you signed up to get four texts a day to remind you to journal what it was during, throughout the course of your day that caused you to worry. And so they were prompted four times a day to write down these things uh, that, they, that they were worrying. And <clears throat> they wanted to capture as many as possible. And then the participants were supposed to later in the day review their list of their worries every evening to see how many of them actually came true. The average person in the study reported three to four testable worries a day. Now, you ready for some amazing stats? This is amazing. The result was a whopping 91% of the worries never happened. 91%. Don't you wish that part of the study would have also included recording how much time you wasted worrying, right? In addition, out of the remaining 9% of the worries that did come true, the outcome was better than expected about a third of the time. So for about one in four participants, exactly zero of their worries actually came to fruition. So much so that those that were doing this research coined a phrase, worries deceit. And the idea behind that, it's such a good way to describe it, is that the nature of worry implicitly demands that we pay attention, but the threat is often not real. You see, peace isn't the absence of things, it's the presence of our incredible God. Now, I need to pause for a second. This week, I've been praying about this quite a bit because I know that this is a subject that is very, very uh, real in so many of our lives. Worry and anxiety can take over, can it? And I know for some of you, you know how that feels because personally, this is something that, you, that you've been dealing with. It could be paralyzing. And so today, I'm kind of walking out into some ground that I know is sacred ground for some of you because this is something that you've been battling perhaps for a very long time. And we know how this works because there's so much study that's been done and there are ways that we can address from a physical standpoint our worry and our, and our anxiety. You could talk to a nutritionist that would help you to know to be very careful about the foods that you eat and the things that you drink. And you could talk to a, a trainer that would help you to know how a physical exertion can help you in your mental health and can help you with our thought lives and you can talk to someone else that would help you strategically plan to get outside and to breathe the fresh air and to feel the sun on your face and we know that all these things are true you can go to a doctor that could help you to, to, to have medication if needed and all of these things can be extremely helpful and we also know that there's this emotional or psychological way that we can approach our worries and our anxieties right so we can go and talk to a therapist and we can get involved in groups that can, that can help us to process these things. We can listen to podcasts and we can read self-help books and all of thing, these things also can be extremely helpful. But today, I have a job to talk to you about the spiritual side of us and attacking worry and anxiety. That's what I do. And I am very concerned that we approach dealing with worry and anxiety from all of these different angles, neglecting or perhaps not knowing how powerful the spiritual aspect is dealing with these things in our lives as well. So I'm hoping and what I've been praying this week is that the things that we talk about today could be implemented in your life that you could see tremendous victories overcoming worry and anxiety in your life because now you're adding another piece of the arsenal to attack the worry and the anxiety that is so much a part of the culture that we live in. Does that sound fair? I'm asking God to do big things today and I've been doing that all week long. We should attack this on all fronts. But I also need to set something straight because so often when life gets very complex and we feel like we're taking it from all sides and there are even times where we feel like something must be wrong because life has gotten difficult. Listen, sometimes we do dumb stuff and there's consequences, amen? And then there's other times where life just happens, right? 
And when life just happens, sometimes we get to feel like something must be wrong. We can even get to a place where we're like, God, where are you at in all of this? Did I do something? Are you punishing me? And we need to be reminded today that scriptures are full of truth that communicate directly to us about the real challenges of life. As a matter of fact, when Jesus was teaching in John chapter 16, he said this, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. And he continues and he says, here on earth, thank you, Jesus, good news, you will have many trials and sorrows. And then he continues, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Listen, I want to remind you, we live in a world that is broken by sin. And you and I are human beings that also have been broken by sin. There is a lot of mess that's part of the world that you and I live in. It can be overwhelming, but these challenges are going to be part of life. Friends, we just need to know how to navigate it. And that's what I want to talk about today. So if you have your Bibles or your devices, if you could turn or swipe to Philippians chapter 4. I absolutely love how practical this passage of scripture is, helping you and I know how to attack worry and anxiety. Now before I read this to you, I want to set the tone. Because sometimes when we read these things in scripture, it feels like just some big fairy tale to us. And we don't really understand all the context of what's happening. So in this, this is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to one of the church that he, the churches that he planted in the city of Philippi. But I want you to know that he's writing this letter and these words while he's in prison. Did you catch that? The life's not, that's a tough situation to be in. Agreed? All right. Let's look at verse six. The apostle Paul says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Now, there's a whole lot in there. I can't wait. I'm so excited to teach this today. Uh, this is an amazing passage of scripture, and I clearly see three things. A problem, I see a prescription for dealing with the problem, oh, and then I see a promise. This is so exciting. First, the problem. Paul says this in verse six, don't worry about anything. Why? Because life's going to be a challenge, and it's going to bring things into your life and mine that will pre kind of dispose us to having worry and anxiety. Paul recognizes it. Again, he's in prison when he's writing this. Life will prompt us to worry. He knows it. <clears throat> now, several years ago, there was a plum creeker that invited me to go hunting with him. We did this for several seasons. I grew up in Chicago. We don't hunt. It's just different there, right? Um, but I thought it would be cool to be an outdoor guy. And I do love to be outside. And uh, we never had a successful hunt in the four or five years that we went. It was really just a lot of hiking up, up mountains into the very back country. And I would tell you this, he's not here today, so I can, this is a moment of confession, that there were a few times, this is how I know you're not going to invite me to go hunting with you. We were back so far, I prayed we wouldn't get anything. <laughs> because I realized if we shot something back there, it was going to be an awful lot of work to get it back down the mountain, right? But one of the things that I noticed when, when we were hunting, which, and again, we're way back in the middle of nowhere. People don't go where we were going the wildlife had created paths for them to walk on. They call them game trails. The animals just had this way of finding the easiest route over the landscape to find water or whatever else. It seemed to me like they collaborated to cause a path in the middle of nowhere, a roadway through the woods. I share that with you today because neuroscience has proven that you and I do the same thing in our minds. They're called neuropathways. Neuropathways. Specifically, as we talk about this topic of anxious thinking, it's often described as a negative neuro pathway. And it's so worn into our minds that we can go into default mode and these thoughts and the way that we think become so habit to us that we don't even recognize what we're doing. Through repeated worry and anxious thoughts, these pathways are paved. When we repeatedly think anxious thoughts, the neural pathways associated with them become stronger and make it easier to fall into this pattern of worry. 
Friends, this is proven science. The more we worry, the more we worry. Our anxious thoughts breed anxious thoughts. We need to change something. We need to do something different because it's not working. It can become so paralyzing in our lives that the worry and the anxiety can take over. It's a vicious cycle. What we're doing is not working. So Paul says this, don't worry about anything. That's a divine command, not a suggestion. And I know what you're thinking. Like Paul was like a spiritual stud, Doug. Like cut us some slack. That's a really hard thing to do, not worry about anything. These negative neural pathways are a real thing. But guys, listen to me. That's not the end of the story. Because God has also created our minds with the ability to adapt through what scientists now call neuroplasticity. You've heard of this before. We got very passionate about neuroplasticity when my son Josh got sick, had strokes that wiped out portions of his brain, and he needed to learn how to reroute them in order for him to function. I am talking today about a divine process of partnership with the Holy Spirit in your life to change the way you think. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, I was, I'm not the only one that talks about this. Listen to what Paul said. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Paul said this in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. How? By changing the way that you think. And then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Friends, there is a way for you and I to collaborate with the work of the Holy Spirit to do this in our lives. And the million dollar question is, how? How? How then do we do that? And I love what Paul does. Now, this takes us from the problem to a two-part prescription. The first one we see in the second part of verse 6. Paul says, don't worry about anything. And he says, instead, pray about everything. Do we just pray about a couple things? Do we pray over our meal? Those are good. But it says, pray about everything. Paul lays it out for us, friends, here. All of our lives are suitable subjects for prayer. No area of your life is missed in terms of its importance to your God. If you struggle with worry and anxiety, what Paul is saying is this. From a spiritual perspective, if you're going to attack this thing the way you should, if you struggle with worry and anxiety, you become a prayer warrior. You double down on this, and you begin to learn to bring these things to your incredible God. Now, a Plum Creeker, a few years ago, hearing a challenge similar, similar to this in the message, I said, what you need to do is have two boxes. You need to have a worry box and you need to have a God box. In all of the stuff that you have a tendency to worry about, I want you to take your thoughts captive by writing them down and put them in your worry box. And then what I want you to do is find a time in your day where you begin to remove the things that are in the worry box pray over them and put them in the God box. Sound like a good idea? He did it. Here's the boxes that he made. And he cut a log and he took the log and wrote on it with a Sharpie the things that he was worried about. At this time, my friend was building a cabin up in the mountains by himself. It's beautiful, by the way. And he was writing down all of the things that he had anxiety and worry about as he was building this cabin up in the mountains. And he would put them into his God box my question is, what good does it do to worry? Remember, 91% of our worries were false alarms. What a great exercise to learn to reroute our thoughts, to take our thoughts captive, to have a worry box that we actually write them down so that we can see them. What are the things that have become so overwhelming to you in your life? And then we put them in the God box, giving them to someone who can actually do something about it. Listen, I double dog dare you to have a God box and a worry box. Start using this exercise to keep track of your thoughts. Paul continues in verse six, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. So theologians will break down this verse and would call this two types of talking with God, this prayer and this supplication. Now they're similar, but they have distinct meanings. 
Prayer encompasses those moments where you're just in conversation with God. The supplication is when you're making your requests and you're asking him to do something to move on your behalf. God invites us to express our desires and to let him know our needs. And we have to remember, <laughs> when we're praying, we're talking to the king of kings. We're talking to the Lord of lords. We're talking to the creator of the universe. The one who has full capacity to handle your worry box. We need to be reminded of this. Paul puts it this way. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. Why? Because when we look into our past and are tenaciously focused on the way he's been faithful, that will give us today the ability to trust him in our present and then it will also help us to be prepared for our future where we can trust and stand on his promises. You see, uh, expressing gratitude alongside of our requests is essential for avoiding this whining and complaining spirit that I know I can have all too quickly. When we approach him with a heart of thanksgiving, we acknowledge his goodness and his provision even in the middle of difficult times. The attitude of gratitude, so to speak, is part of the process of rewiring our brains. Even though God is fully aware of our requests, what Dougie has learned over the years is this, there's just something about me speaking it out loud to my God. Sometimes I'm the one that needs to even hear the things I'm saying. And it's just there's something that happens in my soul when I get these things from in my head, in my heart, out, and communicate with my heavenly Father about these things. Expressing our desires and engaging our hearts and minds in prayers and, and, and prayers of thanks strengthens our faith and deepens our relationship with him. And all of this, friends, is part of the strategic plan that the Apostle Paul is laying out for us, that we would have partnership with the Holy Spirit to be at work in our minds to redo the way we think. So remember what I mentioned earlier, we're challenged to take every thought captive. And then he also said that God will be at work in us to create and transform us into a new person by changing the way we think. So we pray. That's part one of the prescription. Look at verse eight. This is the second part. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts. I love that he says that because isn't that what we need to do? We need to fix our thoughts. But what are we going to fix our thoughts on? He continues, on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. It reminds me of a quote that I read from Dwight Pentecost, who was a, a, a pre preacher and pastor in days gone by. He said this, on the authority of the word of God, I submit to you that the greatest conflict being waged is not international, political, economic, or social. The greatest conflict taking place in the world today is the battle for control of our mind. We know that this is true. We know that he's right on. These positive thoughts that Paul mentions in this verse, the true and the honorable and the right and the pure and the lovely and the admirable, are the results of a mind that is being transformed in partnership with the Holy Spirit. We must collaborate with him. When we fill our minds with these kinds of positive thoughts, they begin to take root and they begin to change us. Collaboration with the Holy Spirit, please hear me, leads to transformation. It will transform the way we think. So I was thinking that it would be important for us to have some assignments this week. And my first assignment is this. Will you please memorize Philippians chapter 4 verse 8? If you've never memorized a verse before, just write it down on a card. As a matter of fact, the, the crew has made a wallpaper for your phone. You can go on our social media sites and you can download it and put it on as wallpaper on your phone to remind you of this verse. And then you use these words to become a prayer to you when you catch your thoughts being something that they shouldn't be. The prayer becomes, Father, help me to fix my thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Help me to think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. And then whether it is that you would uh, make yourself a, a worry box and a God box, or maybe it will be in your journal where you got a worry page and a God page. Maybe you have two notes on your phone, a worry note and a, and a God note. <clears throat> I want you to write down your worries. 
when you feel before the day begins, set a couple of alarms on your phone like they did in the study and write down the things that are, that are most causing you to feel full of worry and anxiousness. Write those things down. And how about if we just don't test it like that, like that uh, study they did at Penn State to see if how many of these things that we're spending so much time worrying about actually come to fruition. And then you write down your prayer requests and you write down what you're thankful for. And if we do these things, please, I beg you to do this, especially if you're in a season where worry and anxiety seems to be taking over. If we do these things, we're gonna engage in this collaborative work of the spirit in our life to start rerouting the way that we think. And then I would encourage you to find someone that you can trust and share your lists with them. Share your worry list with someone. Have them pray with you as you literally move them into the God list or the God box. Share with them your prayer requests and the things that you're thankful for because as we get these things out, there's something so powerful that takes place in our hearts and our minds. Remember, you didn't create these narrow pathways overnight and you're not gonna rewire your brain overnight, but with the Holy Spirit's help, you can. We've got to pray and focus our minds on these positive qualities. And when we do that, our thoughts and actions will align with God's will. Isn't that incredible? All right, but I'm not done, guys. I haven't got to the promise yet. It's a good one. Are you ready? It's a real good one. Look at verse 7. Sandwiched between these two verses that we've been looking at is this amazing promise. Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. It starts by saying, then you will experience God's peace which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Let me break this thing down for you. It starts with the word then, which means some things were done first. And that's the things we just talked about. Instead of worrying, what do we do? We pray about everything. Then we'll experience God's peace. When we begin to take our thoughts captive and focus on these things that are lovely and pure, then those things then lead to a place where we will experience God's peace. Then, and then it says you will. It doesn't say maybe, it says you will. And friends, you can bank on a promise of God. You can build your life on a promise of God. If he says then you will, listen friends, then you will. We just have to collaborate with the work of God in our lives. We need to do what he told us to do and trust him to do what he said he will do. Then you will experience, and it says whose peace? God's peace, that's a whole lot different than peace you're gonna get in your happy spot, friends. This is God's peace, which by the way, Paul further explains, which is why it fits in our series so well. This is a peace that will exceed anything you can understand. There's gonna be moments where all of a sudden the peace of God just comes over and you're gonna be like, what just happened? That feels so good. I can't do that on my own. But when God's at work in our lives and we're implementing the strategy and the plan that's laid out for us here, we begin to rewire our minds and then all of a sudden we have this peace, this vital distinction is different. How different? It's beyond calculation. It's irrational, mind-blowing peace. Friends, who doesn't want that? Now I'm starting to sound like an infomercial. (laughs) Man, I'm not done yet. That's not all, right? Check out what happens next. What does this peace do? Look at verse seven. This is so awesome. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Now, first of all, you need to know that this word guard is literally a military term. It's like special ops standing right with you, guarding your heart and your mind. That's very powerful. This is the promise a vigilant guard over your heart and your mind. By using both of these words, hearts and minds, Paul was making a comprehensive reference to all of who we are on the inside. That God's peace will guard us on the inside. We protect what we value, don't we? You think about the things that you value most. It's likely your spouse, your children, your family, your friends, your house, your car, your ring, your 401k. We want to protect the things that matter most to us. Listen, God does too. Everyone look at me. You know what he values most? Are you ready? You. 
He values you. And when we do what he said, he cares so much about you that he also values your heart and your mind. Why? Because isn't this where the enemy attacks? This is where it comes. And this is where it starts and we end up in a tailspin where all of a sudden these things are so overwhelming. They're taking over our lives. So friends, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you as we wrap up our time today. We need to attack worry and anxiety from every angle. But don't you dare leave out the spiritual. Because there's power here available for us. This can be a game changer for us. And so this week, as I was praying over this passage of scripture, there's a couple of things that I need to say as we wrap up today. The first one is this. Please hear me. You can't have God's peace unless you have peace with God. Do you understand what I'm saying there? We can't expect expect that this fluttering peace will just show up in our life if you don't have peace with God first. That means you have to have made a decision to submit all of who you are to him. I like to describe that as stepping across the line of faith and saying, God, I'm yours. I will will mess this life up fast, but I choose to submit it to you, and I need your help, Father. Thank you for what you've done for me. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the sacrifices on the cross. Please forgive me. When you, You can't experience God's peace unless you have peace with God first. And then I also felt challenged to tell you this. That's not a one and done thing, friends. When the Lord speaks to you, when the Holy Spirit prompts you, and you don't have internal peace with him because something's not right in your life, you need to make it right. If we want to experience this peace that we're talking about today, we have to keep a short order with our Father. Because when we don't feel like we've done right, what do we want to do? Do we want to go be near him? No, we want to be far from him because we don't feel worthy of him. And that's why we must have this internal peace with God first. And once we've had that, then see, it's easier for us to find ourselves in a place where we're leaning full into the presence and the work of the Spirit in our life so that he can help us and, and do what he said by guarding us this way. So this week, I want us to learn to not worry, but to really pray, to live thankful and to keep our thoughts captive It's a relationship, you see. It's a relationship with God and the Holy Spirit at work in us. And then we get to this next level where we're experiencing this guarding peace over our lives. So I want to speak to you here today, those of you that are overwhelmed with worry and anxiety. Listen to those circumstances. God's peace is guarding your mind and your heart. The enemy can't touch you there when we do this right. There are financial challenges that some of you are facing and it's throwing you into a tailspin. Listen, God's peace, it can be there to guard your heart and your mind. The enemy can't touch you there. To the negative doctor's report that someone has gotten this week or has been fighting with, listen, God's peace can guard your heart and your mind. He can't touch you there. To those problems that you have at work, listen, God's peace can be right there with you, guarding your heart and your mind. Listen, you can't touch this is what we need to tell the enemy. (laughs) Listen, uncertainty of politics, right? What do we need to say? Listen, I submit that worry and that anxiety to God because he's going to protect my mind. It sounds like we need a soundtrack. (laughs) Oh, maybe you heard it. The soundtrack is not MC Hammer, friends. The soundtrack comes straight from the word of God and it's a promise that you can stand on. And again, with a very tender heart today, I know this has taken a few of you down hard. And that's why this message is so important. That's also why God puts this in the word for us to be able to see so that we could unpack it, unpack it in practicality in our lives so that we can reroute the way that we think. Friends, you don't have to be overwhelmed with worry and anxiety. You can stand, truly stand, on the promises of your incredible God. Will you bow your heads with me for just a moment? Father, I thank you so much for how practical scriptures can be. And I thank you for Paul who wrote from a prison these words that can be so life-changing for us 
And Lord, I know it's not familiar to all of us and it takes discipline to do these things. And Lord, I know that life can just be so overwhelming and can fill us with worry and anxiety. And we also know that there's an enemy at play that just loves to wreak havoc in our minds. And Lord, for some of us, we've even gotten to a place where we just describe ourselves as worriers. We describe ourselves as just anxiety ridden and that there's no way that we could ever overcome. And Lord, I know this is not simple. And I know we've been attacking this from all kinds of different fronts, but Father, today I pray that you will help us to double down on the attack of these things because we will focus in as well on the spiritual uh, prescription that you've laid out for us. And Lord, today I'm just so bold to stand on your word and pray for your promises to be true in my friends' lives. God, we need you. We need a different game plan and we need to work this plan. So I thank you that you've created our minds to be created in such a wonderful way that we can even reroute the way that we think. And now, Lord, we need your help. So I pray that the power of the Holy Spirit would be at work in our lives. Lord, I pray also for someone today that has yet to step across the line of faith. They don't have peace with you and their life is full of unrest. And if that's you and you're prepared and ready to step across the line of faith, just tell him that today. In your words, Lord, I need you. I give you my life. I submit myself to you. I ask you to forgive me. I thank you for the work you did on the cross. I pray that you would help me to grow in my understanding of all that you are, even in the ways that we've talked about today. Lord, I pray for all of us as well that you've tapped us on the shoulder and we know that something's not right in our relationship with you. We can't expect to have God's peace at work in our lives when we don't have peace with you. And so, Lord, we just submit ourselves to you once again. We ask for your forgiveness where we need to ask for forgiveness. Lord, we ask for closeness to you as we intentionally grow in our understanding of what it means to put these things into practice. And Lord, will you just help us this week? that we would take our thoughts captive, that we would submit them to you, that we would hold ourselves accountable to focusing on the right kinds of things, that we would double down in our time of prayer, and that, Lord, when we do these things, we would experience your promise of a peace that will blow our minds. Father, I pray that over my friends today. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen.